You heard me say it, I want to talk about callings. Callings come in many different kinds and in many ways. Some callings, a lot of them, most of them last a lifetime. Some of them are temporary assignments. Some of them are small and some of them are great. But what you need to understand is when a calling comes from Jesus, it's just as valuable and meaningful to him no matter how great or small or how long or short the term is. I noticed that in our gospel reading today that Jesus took the vocation of a fishing industry, sort of tweaked it and morphed it and turned it into a kingdom purpose. Fishing for fish became fishing for people. I like that. A vocation taken to a higher purpose. And they also immediately left in obedience when they responded to their calling. No fuss, no fight, just the master calls, I will obey. It was very simple. Sometimes we need to be prepared to execute our calling. You heard the story of Jonah, the kids did so wonderfully, where God calls and Jonah turns the opposite way. He wasn't ready to fulfill his calling the first time. God had to do a deeper work to bring him into obedience and willingness where he could do it willingly without fighting with God. And sometimes when it comes to fulfilling one's calling, sometimes God needs to prepare us to execute our calling. A deeper work in the heart where love for God grows and a deeper compassion for humanity begins to rise in one's heart makes us fit and prepared and equipped to execute our calling. There's something romantic and fulfilling about responding to God's calling, and I'm not just talking about ordained ministry. In our Lutheran faith, we teach the priesthood of all believers, and the scriptures testify that it's exactly what God's calling is, the priesthood of all believers, where everybody is a player and not just a spectator. There's just way too many churches in our country, in our nation, in all denominations, where churches are nothing more than sheep pens, where just some food is thrown at them once or twice or three times a week and they're never equipped to fulfill and live out their callings. They're just a bunch of stones thrown together when the Lord's ideal for his house everywhere was to be living stones, living united together in a common cause and purpose to expand the kingdom. In other words, Jesus wants us to be a player in the game and not just a spectator. When I look at this gospel reading, I, I notice a couple of things immediately. There were those who were out in the boats fishing. They're the headliners, they're the front ones, they're the visible ones out there fishing in the lake. But then I notice there's also those who are in the boat mending the nets. Yet they share a common calling to be fishers of people. And I like that mending of the nets one because it reminds me of a very important calling and gift in the body of Christ. That is healing restoring, mending, coming back into wholeness so that the work can continue. There are callings that are visible and out front and there are callings behind the scenes. Both have equal value and meaning in the sight of God for the kingdom. They both work together, both important in a common cause for the kingdom. You know, we were meant to have a purpose, a calling, all the way to the end of our life. As long as we breathe, are able to take nourishment and put on clothes, we should have some sense of purpose to our life. Do you know what a life looks like when it doesn't have a sense of calling or a sense of purpose? Well, I know because I was a person like that once before a calling came to me. I was restless. I was unfulfilled. I would complain. I would grumble. Nothing would seem right. And sometimes in my grumbling and complaining, I simply didn't have enough to do. Until God's call came one day, and when it came, it came with his love. My life felt filled with romance. It felt irresistible, even though I fought him for a while. I finally responded, and I didn't know the fulfillment I would know until I first walked through that narrow gate. 
And then I remember a time looking back through that gate that I walked to that was so narrow, when I looked behind me and looked at it, all of a sudden it's bigger than the first time I entered it. And I asked myself, what was all the fuss and the fight about? If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't know what I'd be missing. I remember when I was a chaplain at a hospital at Health East in St. Paul, Minnesota. One unit that I served was called the Post-Respiratory Care Unit. There was a man on that unit about 82 years old, and everybody knew him fondly as Woody. He called me into his room one day, and he said, Chaplain Bill, that was my title at the time, he said, I cannot see why God causes me to continue to live. I don't know any purpose my life serves when I am paralyzed from the neck all the way down. What use am I to God? I said, we need to pray about that. So we did. And I asked God to reveal to him a sense of purpose for what years of his life he had left. Sometime later, he called me into his room again and told me, I've got a strange story to tell you that I don't think anybody else would believe because if I started sharing it with medical staff, they'd probably lock me in a padded cell and give me medication and drugs. I can only tell someone like you. Well, then I knew I was about to hear something. At the end of his bed was this picture, a three-dimensional picture, where Jesus stands at the door and knocks. The doorknob is missing, saying that it can only be opened from the inside by the person whose house door he's knocking on. It's a quotation in picture form of Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He pointed at that picture. And he said, I must have been seeing things, but he said during the night or in the early morning hours, about three o'clock, that picture literally grew six feet tall. And Jesus walked out of that picture and he came to my bedside and he said, it's not your time to go yet. I have one more thing I'm going to ask you to do. And when the time comes, you will know exactly what it is. It just turns out that his estranged son he hadn't seen for about 16 years came to visit his dad. And he came to apologize and ask for forgiveness for the ways he'd treated his father all his life. And Woody had his own issues with his son. There was forgiveness and reconciliation that took place between them. And even more important, his son gave his heart to Jesus Christ as a result of that conversation father was used as an instrument in his own son's conversion. Two days later, he died. That was his final calling. 82 years old, he still had a purpose for God to fulfill. I will never forget it. One of my favorite authors is the name of Rick Joyner. He's an international speaker. He goes all over the world and does conferences equipping saints in the body of Christ to live out their calling. He often does a survey of people, asking Christians, how many of you know your true calling or your sense of purpose in life? He came away saying that less than 10%, around 5%, only are the ones that know their true calling in life. I surveyed Wednesday night and I surveyed Saturday night and asked for a show of hands, how many of you really, really know the calling on your life and what God is calling you to do? And that percentage came out about right. That's the way it seems to be everywhere, doesn't it? God has something he calls us to do. So how do you know if God is calling you for something to do? One clue I like to tell people when they ask is, what's your core passion? I believe that passions are given by God. I believe he impregnates us in our spirit with a sense of purpose and calling that's not yet realized, nor is the strategy as to how to fulfill it has not been revealed. But it begins deep within the spirit as a core passion. So what do you do with it then when it's there? Well, that's the beautiful romantic part. What is that one thing? You'll have to go to God to find out because it's so closely tied with your own intimate relationship with him. So you start to look for passion. Did you notice Marilee when she gave her announcement about some things she's interested in doing? Did she look dull and depressed and bored when she talked to you? Passion. 
Well, how about these people singing up here this morning or the kids when they gather around the kids' sermon? Did you notice their passion for what they do? They're living their calling. When I was up at Mount Carmel for a working vacation on interpreting dreams, when my wife and I were there, it suddenly dawned on us, we felt like we were doing what we were born to do. And the romance of God comes with it, and love comes with it, and tears come when you see people whose lives are touched and encouraged, when they realize for the first time that they've had dreams for years they didn't understand or couldn't interpret. It was like an unopened love letter from God. Some of you have been having dreams you don't understand. And God's been trying to reveal a calling or a message of love to you to draw you closer and more intimately closer to him so he can speak to you and reveal what he has for you. Purpose is so closely tied to passion, they're almost the same thing. So when Jesus called these mere fishermen, he took their vocation to a higher level. I've seen God call people from the sales industry or I've seen auto salesmen become evangelists because they're now out there talking to people about the gospel and relationship with Jesus Christ, and they have a foundation already built in their vocation that makes it possible for God to morph and change that into something else. I've seen God call corporate people into missions and organizations where they are involved in strategic planning to push forward something that expands the kingdom. But really, God will take whatever you have, no matter how small or great, and turn it into something lovely and beautiful that benefits somebody else and not just ourselves. He's looking for people who want to be players and not just spectators. Are you one of those? I ask you, are you a spectator or a player? What's your passion? Has God made you pregnant with a purpose? Or do you need help in searching for one? I can't tell you what your calling is. That can only come from God, and he means it to be so because he wants a relationship with us in terms of our calling. He wants to partner with us to be a blessing and to expand his kingdom. Heaven wants to know so that that process can begin, and it can begin this morning if you like. Jesus is always looking for a person open to be interested in following him. And folks, it's never too late to start. You're never too old to begin or to participate. When I read in Joshua chapter 13, I find God said this to Joshua. This is interesting. You are now very, very old, and there are still many lands to be conquered. In other words, he was saying, you know, time's running out. The vision I have for you is bigger than you and your life and your tenure. Time to get started. There's a lot to do because when I'm done with you, I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. It's bigger than you. So it is with callings. But they draw us in, and they draw us in more deeply in love with God and His purposes. Are you a spectator or a player? Heavenly Father, I ask that you begin to reveal your callings to those who have a calling this morning. I ask you to speak words of love and encouragement. If there's anything that inhibits them from responding in obedience to God, I pray that you heal, restore, and mend places of brokenness in their heart. If someone struggles with risk or lacking faith or knowing how to begin, I pray that you would come and you would help that person realize and fulfill their purpose in you. Through Jesus' sake we pray, amen.